uh, Richard Freeman and Mary Taylor are here with us and they're gonna uh, start this thing off properly. Uh, and today we're kicking off studying the Bhagavad Gita or God's song, or some people say the song of the Lord. And uh, we'll, let, we'll let them uh, kind of tune us into it. So take it away, guys. Thank you, John. Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you. Um, so we wanted to, we will only be talking for about 45 minutes. And the Mahabharata, which is the big hymn from which the Bhagavad Gita comes, is one of the longest books, in if not the longest, in the world. So we won't cover the whole thing tonight or this morning. Um, but we'll try. And so the, it's this huge hymn that we'll reference a little bit in later. But what we are doing now is going to talk about the Bhagavad Gita, which is a central part of this big story that is this story of this war. Um, and the main characters of the Bhagavad Gita are Arjuna, who is a has been trained his whole life as a warrior. He's also a prince and a sweet, genuine, genuine and compassionate young man, a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant guy. And then his best friend, his, who turns out in this story to be his charioteer, we were just talking to John about why that is. Mm -hmm. um, and also sort of someone you may have heard of who is Krishna. Um, and Krishna is the charioteer for Arjuna through this story, uh, essentially symbolically meaning the person who, who guides him and carries him, but doesn't necessarily, you know, as any good charioteer, you're told where to go and then you avoid accidents. And so that's sort of the role that, that Krishna takes uh, actually is one of teacher to student, the teacher being Krishna, the student being Arjuna. And one of the techniques that is very powerful as a teacher is to be there holding space and allowing students uh, or children, if you have children, to find their way, giving them the content, the information, the support they need, but then not just saying, here, do this, do this. Uh, instead, letting them stick the screwdriver in the electrical socket, um, almost, um, and then saving them from such a fate. And so the story begins uh, of the Bhagavad Gita. There's this big uh, war that's about to, a big battle that's about to happen and that's been evolving for years and years and years uh, between uh, two sections of actually what was one family and that's what uh, is you know extended family and I think that's one of the profound things that's realized when uh, Krishna actually draws the chariot up on the middle path between the two armies. Arjuna, who has been uh, kind of awakened by the blowing of conch shells, he looks and he says, oh, look at this, basically one family, because he saw on both sides. And uh, it's his family. Yeah. <laughs> his, 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 his extended, extended family. family, yeah, on both sides. And he has teachers on both sides. And he knows the, uh, the politics on both sides. And, uh, and people that he really adores. Uh, and, and so they're there to be, you know, Arjuna is there to be one of the warriors to fight in this battle and to, as he pulls up to this middle path between the two sides, he is completely overcome by um, a crisis of conscience where he realizes that he has been trained his whole life to be a warrior, but also a prince, uh, someone- A diplomat. A diplomat. <laughs> and he, um, he is an impassioned person. And he realizes that if he goes ahead and fights, many, many, many people he loves and respects will die. 
Um, and if he doesn't, the same is true. So he is representing what we all run into um, in differing degrees throughout our lives. Uh, um, circumstances that are complicated that may present crises. And so the book is a story um, that is, you know, the story of this particular crisis of them pulling up into this battlefield. And it happens to be the battlefield that is the battlefield of um, Dharma and action. So purpose and action in a sense. And, you know, he's, he's completely overwhelmed by this, but also the book is one that, the Bhagavad Gita is one that really relies on and teaches the value of relationship. The relationship between Krishna and Arjuna for one, or the relationship between these families, or the relationship that we all have to the environment and to nature and to the each world other and to each other. Um, and so it's one um, that it emphasizes that. And then the book also truly emphasizes the power and importance of embodiment. Um, and so it's for yoga practitioners or people interested in studying yoga asana or philosophy. It is just this profound book that um, allows us to really truly um, get to the juice of what life is all about. And then explore that. And so it begins when they drive up onto the field. And, you know, as John was saying, uh, Arjuna is, you know, the strong guy. Well, Arjuna is famous for good posture yeah. as a yoga because he's ambidextrous and he, he's able to shoot bow and arrow behind his back while looking at reflections of things. So he's, uh, he's extremely embodied by nature and has good yoga he has naturally good posture and so to see arjuna slump which is what he does and break down on the chair is just like this has never happened before it's, it's just completely and so he just says i can't do this you know it's too much for me uh i i'm i'm he drops his bow he drops his uh mm. conch and he just collapses. And that's where the teachings begin. And it begins with an overview of Sankhya theory. Yeah, which doesn't actually answer Arjuna's question, which is, <laughs> what, should I fight or should I not fight? And, uh, but that's actually very brilliant in that uh, Krishna never ac actually answers his question he says do at the very end he says do as you choose you know after all these teachings now you know just take shot or well, maybe that's the wrong word but, <laughs> uh, do as you know your best take your best shot at it and then you're going to get feedback and then you'll learn um you know because who knows uh what's going to actually work and so he begins by uh Pointing, you know, Arjuna is actually kind of weeping and is, you know, in a very tamasic state, and uh, and so Krishna's first teaching is, uh, you know, you're you're talking about wisdom, but someone who's wise, Arjuna, uh, never grieves for the living or for the dead. Um, what's your problem? <laughs> and he goes on to explain uh, the teaching of Sankhya, which is. Um, a very um, important thing to understand in, in if, if studying the Gita. So Sankhya, basically, the word means to enumerate things, you know, making lists, which was a particularly in the, the, the culture in those days, making lists of things uh, is very important. You know, these, these are the 20, 20 of those, and that's 10 of those, and 64 of those, and uh, people love that. Um, but the basic teaching of Sankhya is extremely slippery. And uh, let me see if I can sum it up in a couple of <laughs> words. Oh, Sankhya is saying, well, let's, we're going to begin by saying, oh, there are these two things, um, Purusha and Prakriti. And Purusha um, 
is the true you. It just means the person uh, and non-gender specific. Uh, Purusha is just the, the person, the that which matters. And Prakriti is creative, that which comes forth. And that's creative energy. And, um, and we think, oh, that's not a problem. And then as what Sankhya does, and this is what most people don't have the patience for, and the, the Gita does it too, in a way that's much more entertaining than just the... Um, dry. Yeah, the, just, just the dry Sankhya. <laughs> is, well, okay. Um, Purusha is witnessing, or is just witnessing Prakriti, and Prakriti is unfolding. And it turns out that anything that can be perceived, anything at all, is Prakriti. And so, and then we think, and in our minds, we think, oh, Purusha is just this, uh, you know, men like to think, oh, it's a man. And then they, they learn later in history that it's actually a god, you know, they have all these theories. And women are told to think it's a man. And yeah, <laughs> women are told to think it's a man too, culturally. <laughs> um, but that, no, uh, they're pointing out that any idea that you have, that is also Prakriti. So everything that can be perceived even grossly or subtly perceived as a direct perception or perceived as an idea or a subtle image or even things that you can't perceive that are part of uh, uh, causal patterns, that is also Prakriti. So the idea of Purusha is composed of Prakriti. Okay. And so when people first start following or trying to understand Sankhya, which is the oldest philosophical system. And it's also non-Vedic, technically. It's not part of the Orthodox community, but it became, you know, it was so uh, fun and funny to, to those who kind of really went into it that uh, Vedic culture said, yeah, we'll take that too. And, <laughs> and so at first glance, because you have Prakriti and Purusha, you are, you know, the tendency is to think of it as a dualistic. Yeah. And the thing is, it breaks down. So whenever I think any idea I have of Purusha and Prakriti is composed 100% of Prakriti. So it is actually any definition of Purusha is composed of Prakriti. And so what you're looking at, the ideas you're having are Prakriti. And so, and that's how Purusha is revealed, but revealed as a metaphor by just why it's just like watching a tree blossom, uh, flowers bloom, nature. Uh, I, that's all prakriti. And so what you get here, and this is, is you get a, what is called a metaphysical self-reference paradox, uh, which was big in with, uh, you know, thinkers like Wittgenstein, who you now have to study, uh, and friends, uh, that. Uh, um, any, any term you use for the absolute, uh, whether it be God or Atman or Shunyata, Shunyata is a big, important term uh, in understanding. Uh, it's actually used in the Gita. Um, any term uh, doesn't actually mean what it means in ordinary language. And to say what it means is merely um, a temporary bobble that is still can't be included in the term. So the term cannot include itself. And this is actually a huge joy to those who study the Gita, uh, who study uh, philosophy, uh, who might be like Vyas uh, or Sanjaya, who is the very important character that uh, is actually narrating the entire Gita to the blind king. Uh, Dude, blind, uh, he can't see. Uh, and so really when you see Purusha and Prakriti in this way, what you and have absorbed it physically almost, what you are experiencing is a sense, an embodied sense of interconnectedness, of their, you know, the, the sort of relationship that is imperative between these two concepts rather than a dichotomy, rather than a dualistic system. Mm -hmm. And you see this 
And it turns out that uh, interconnectedness is one of the primary themes of the Bhagavad Gita as well. Um, and as you see this represented with Sankhya, you partly see it because of the concept of the gunas acting on the gunas. Um, and that is also a, a primary part of the uh, Sankhya philosophy and appears throughout the entire um, Gita. And so the gunas mm -hmm. acting on the gunas, Richard will talk about in a second, but it is this, uh, this idea that allows us to see not only interconnectedness, but impermanence and allows us to become comfortable um, with these uh, broad ideas um, in a, an ever-changing world. Yeah, so guna guneshu, <laughs> that's like a mantra. So any verse you like in the Gita can become your, your mantra for the day. Guna guneshu vartanta, that's my, you know, I just can't get it out of my head. And so anything, that you're experiencing, you're like say you're doing yoga and you feel light, uh, or you feel like a tube that goes from your heart over to the crown of your head, or you feel uh, anything you experience. Um, what the Gita is pointing out, what Sankhya points out is saying, oh, that's Prakriti too. That's this divine interconnected, unfolding, blossoming, uh, totally impermanent, totally empty of actual anything permanent uh, self. And these are things that people normally wouldn't think. Oh, I saw this light. I saw God or, or I saw, you know, um, you know, I had a vision of, you know, this deity or this uh, prophet. And, but the Gita was very gently pointing out, oh, that's Prakriti too. And then I feel like, oh, this clear, clean air in my nostrils because I've been practicing. And, uh, and then they say, oh, that's Prakriti too. And it's like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. And then all of your, your religious ideas, your mantras, um, your uh, Indra and uh, Varuna and you know, all of the, the, the gods and then the, the demons, oh, uh, you know, they're composed entirely of Prakriti too. And this is an intense teaching uh, because uh, when it's saying that everything is impermanent, Arjuna, nothing ever dies, you know, even all of your ideas about how that feels. Oh, I see, like the 11th chapter, um, uh, it's revealed, or Arjuna kind of, it isn't actually an hallucination, but he sees all of the heads of all of his friends and people on the battlefield being crushed between the teeth of this uh, horrific form that he's imagining is reality. And he, this is time and it's crushing. He says some of the, and the, my, you know, they get their heads caught between the teeth, you know, like, uh, you know, blueberries or something. And so, and, but all of that also is guna guneshu. It's all gunas on gunas. And so, and then when you realize that you just have this sense of, uh, anything I say is going to be gunas on gunas. But let me define gunas. So the three gunas, tamas, rajas, sattva. Uh, tamas just means fixed, steady. And this is very important if you're going to create time and space. And then soon after there's a fixedness and steadiness, which is like a, you know, one point, one thing. Uh, the, in the background, there's forming the antithesis to it. Uh, which is the entire context. And antithesis is the immediate context or definitions that, but then if you stick with the antithesis is everything else, uh, which is quite limitless. And then when you realize, which is a very- And that's now rajas. And then, yeah, the rajas. But then when you see, oh, uh, the thesis and the antithesis are actually interdependent. Um, there's not a conflict, there's just an interdependence. Then you have what is called sattva, uh, which is like, ah, sat meaning truth, uh, truthness, uh, truthness. And truthness is the, the light. Oh, but then I just defined another thesis that needs an, if I, so anything I say 
then has to go through the process of synthesis. And in the synthesis, there's the, that's the prakriti unfolding or being given space. And, and, and so when you so. look closely, whether it's an idea like this or whether it's um, a relationship that you happen to be in or you know, a, an action that you happen to be taking, you know, the idea is that everything has that sort of wave pattern of something that is stuck, tamas, or, and stuck is a prejudicial sounding word. So it's solid, stable, not moving. Um, and when we, as yoga practitioners, start thinking about the gunas or sattva, tamas, and rajas, often people say, well, I just want the good stuff. I want to have I everything want sattvic. sattvic. <laughs> and it doesn't work like that. Life is not like that. The idea is that you have to have this stability. You, and then the rajas element that comes along and upsets the apple cart. And then it doesn't actually, it only upsets it in your mind, really, because the whole thing is still one. It doesn't separate everything out even if the apples have fallen way away from the cart. And then that, that is this new formation of something that suddenly blossoms into something that is this remarkable balanced quality of sattva. But then if you sit in the state of things being sattvic, um, it, you know, it's like as you sit down to watch a movie, if you do at night and you, you know, you're all spunky and you sit down and by 15 minutes in when you've collapsed like that, that's where sattva has like degraded into Thomas. And you need to have like a little boot coming along to kick you into the next um, integrated form. And so this idea of mm -hmm. this wave pattern of change is, uh, really strong in the Gita and appears over and over um, and is one that is really worth contemplating because it is one that demonstrates to us the real necessity in order to face the crises that we have in order for Arjuna to face the crises that he has. Um, we have to be uh, agile enough to be comfortable with not knowing circumstances, not you know, doing the very best we can and trusting the process of the um, changing of time, the changing of circumstance. And so it's a really key um, mm. idea in the Gita, but it's also a key idea in Buddhism and overall in yoga. And we see that in our asana practice, where if you are too stuck in your ways with what you think your leg will do today, um, that can turn out to be a problem. Um, not Maybe not every time, but, but over the big picture of things, it does. And so th that is a huge lesson that in the very, very beginning of the Gita, Ar Arjuna is taught by Krishna to trust interconnectedness and to trust impermanence. Um, and, and that leads him to this idea of part of what gives him stability in, or any of us stability in an ever-changing environment like that is to have some sense of who we are. Our dharma and our yoga practice are our actions, those are the sort of, some of the things that help us to get our feet on the ground so that we can be steady and stable in the face of ever-changing circumstances. So Dharma is something that is very important to sort of look at when we're, we're considering the Gita. The Dharma in the sense of, you're thinking initially in the sense of duty, uh, but it's also in the sense of the quality uh, of something. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, and so there's, there's a funny phrase, Sanatan Dharma, which uh, is big, you know, in which is almost a response to Buddhist Dharma teaching, um, meaning the eternal Dharma, but by eternal, uh, what do you mean? And so, because 
what is time? And so the interesting thing about the, the, the Sankhya teaching uh, is that uh, it always makes you question uh, what's, what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, here's Arjuna, and he has to do something. And so, <laughs> so what, what should I do? And our, Krishna doesn't actually answer that uh, in, the, in the Gita, which is like, you know, but he gives some hints, you know, why don't you do what actually works? And so, his, so if you look at the story, mm -hmm. Arjuna's dharma is, is sort of, dharma can mean our our job, our duties, our um, sort of what we, our purpose in life is. And in, in a very sort of pragmatic way, mm -hmm. um, Arjuna's dharma <clears throat> as a warrior and a diplomat, in this case, a warrior should just, you know, charge into battle and fight. He's been training his whole life to do that. So at the beginning here, Krishna is saying, you know, this is what your duty is. You know, everybody will laugh at you if you don't go in and fight. And this is what you must do. But what he's, uh, the, the actual bigger picture that he's setting up for Arjuna to recognize is that Dharma, whether it happens to be that you are a warrior or a painter or whatever, but Dharma is completely context dependent. Um, and our little dharmas, like the dharma of who I am as a, you know, identity in my, my little world. Mm -hmm. um, and the big context is really our svadharma, who we deeply are, which has to interface with the everyday ideas of what our dharmas are, who we are. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things Richard often has said, which I love, is the idea of, you know, when you're trying to understand this concept of what is Dharma, what does that mean in the big picture of things, because it can mean the teachings and the duty, etc. But when you've called it the glue that holds everything together, um, mm -hmm. because it is when we look at it as that, it then starts to really reflect um, the buddhi in a, in a way that I think is amazing. Yeah, so buddhi meaning the intelligence and uh, dharma meaning that which kind of holds things together or deeper patterns. And so then there's, of course, the term uh, eternal dharma. But if you start looking at that, uh, then what do you mean by time? And so, and Wonderfully, the Gita actually takes time apart uh, in the 11th chapter. Uh, so there are many different levels to what we mean by duty or dharma. And so... Um, but whatever your dharma is... You'll have... You yeah. have to take action. Yeah, you'll have many different levels of it. And there's contextual dharma. Um, mm -hmm. Most dharmas are... and. And so in this circumstances, what, what should I do? You know, Arjuna is in this difficult situation where all of a sudden he's waking up and his inside is brilliant because he sees friends and relatives on both sides of these armies. And he's going, wait a minute, this is not going to work out. And uh, the answer, just the answer of uh, this purest socket doesn't give, tell him exactly what to do. And so he's still at the end of, this, you know, you've taught me uh, this wonderful teaching about, science, but you still haven't told me what I got to do in this terrible circumstance. And so uh, Arjuna is brilliant in that he just keeps pushing. You know, he doesn't uh, say, okay, I'm a believer and I surrender, but uh, he keeps that. And that's one of the beauties of the, is the continuous inquiry. And he, even if uh, in through into the last, at the very Arjuna is still like at what do you mean by that? What do you mean? What's the context? And so, so he at the kind of beginning of the book has figured out okay, well, then my dharma must mean more than just going out and fighting, but still, what should I do? And he constantly comes up with these 
di you know, sort of dichotomies, like, should I do this or should I do that? Is this better than this? He never wants to see the middle path, although drawing up between the two armies in the middle path is what has illuminated him, what has awakened his actual right. intelligence. Right, and of course that's metaphorical for the, our own middle path or sushumna, but, and once he's seen that, he's seen, oh my God, it's all this interconnected, uh, whatever, he's, he, he's stunned and he does, Arjuna is brilliant in that he doesn't like fake it, you know, where, where he says, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, forget that and, you know, just kill all these people. But he, he keeps questioning and he keeps getting excellent answers, but the answers don't actually, they're all context dependent. And so if he's taught to do his duty, then he has to discover what his duty actually is. Um, or if he's, <laughs> and, uh, and his friend, um, uh, Krishna just keeps kind of pushing the, the situation along. And Arjuna is brilliantly honest, but he, he throughout the entire text, and that's what one of the beauties of it, in that he still, he's like, oh, I understand, but wait a second, what? And he keeps going back to asking questions or inquiring. And so what's really important for those of us who practice yoga asana, or who practice meditation, or preferably who practice yoga asana as a meditative practice, is that mm. what Krishna starts kind of nudging Arjuna towards is this idea of what is it that yoga uh, brings? What is it that yoga brings to this conundrum of you know, facing complexities in the world, having some sense of our dharma, knowing we have to take action, which in the Gita, karma is defined as action, and that it is these practices of yoga and of what yoga brings to us that continually bring us back into the embodied state through which we can begin to behave intelligently and with compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the interesting things that the I've seen in the Gita is that if you say, okay, it's all impermanent, it's all prakriti, uh, therefore, doesn't matter. You know, who cares if all these people die because they're as good as dead anyway. <laughs> and interestingly enough, uh, in the mythologies uh, and stories around this, uh, there are a lot of uh, demons or demonic beings who would agree with that. And so, <laughs> yeah, let's just kill them all because they're as good as dead anyway. And, uh, and that teaching is very systematically disassembled um, because then, you know, the, to say that, uh, you know, all these bodies and all these situations and planets in this entire universe is completely because it's not impermanent, therefore it's just basically trash. And, uh, oh, you Ravana, you have to look up Ravana, uh, can go ahead and just exploit it to death. And, uh, and so that is revealed by, through this uh, dialogue with, in the Gita, that's, that's revealed as extreme suffering, uh, that extreme attitude or misunderstanding. And so now we're gonna see that, uh, yes, it's all impermanent, but what does that mean? And, uh, and so we have the idea of uh, Arjuna's dharma, or what is his actual duty in this situation, uh, which he's trying to figure out. And, uh, and, and then since he's going to act, and the inevitability of, is it him acting, or is it just his body and mind acting? And this is the, the beauty of the Sankhya system is that, well, it's actually just your body and mind, but the, the, what happens is with any embodied being is they'll understand, oh, I'm not this body, or I'm not this mind, I'm not these thoughts. And then just like invisibly, it flips and, and they create another uh, false you know, or misunderstanding of things. And so that's... Uh, and that's time and space and this identity. 
And so karma is the nature of prakriti, it's the nature of action. But what happens even with embody, even with great beings, even uh, and Krishna was also demonstrated that he would do this too. He would flip into this subtle identity with uh, either the gross body or the subtle body or with the anything that is creative energy. There's this identity that naturally forms almost, it's an invisible change. And this is the creative principle of time and space. And so even in the myth of the Mahabharata, Krishna, uh, who is, you know, is pretty smart, uh, he also uh, would, he had an Achilles heel, which you have to read the, the Mahabharata to understand. <laughs> Um, because he couldn't manifest without playing a game, and the game is, oh, this is me, and that isn't me. And that's the game of, of creation. Uh, so karma, what do you do? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that um, turns out to be very important to learn to do is to, to sacrifice. Um, and that's a huge um, teaching also that Krishna gives to Arjuna and that for those of us who are embodied beings, understanding what is meant by sacrifice is really a key to being able to navigate through complexities. So mm -hmm. in the Gita, uh, there's a, a big section on <clears throat> how you know what does sacrifice mean and what is the benefit of it and and sacrifice obviously you know we think of it as oh I'm going to sacrifice something and it almost becomes like a again a duty or you know oh, I've got to sacrifice this to do what I want to do and that's not what is meant or, by sacrifice or, or it is that but yeah, a lot of people when we make sacrifices we want everybody to know that oh yeah. look at my sacrifice <laughs> look how great i am of course i'm not sacrificing my stupidity <laughs> I'm, I'm just sacrificing um and so much of the uh vedic religion is is based on yajna or sacrifice and because sacrifice implies rather than the word karma and it's a form of action but it's something that is like, whoa, I've got to give up something that uh, is essential to me. And of course, you know, I'm going to sacrifice, uh, in the olden days, I'm going to sacrifice somebody else, <laughs> or I'm going to sacrifice a horse, or I'm going to sacrifice, uh, you know, like uh, in some religions, I'm going to sacrifice my firstborn child. Uh, uh, or I'm going to sacrifice something that I don't want anymore. You know, I'm going to <laughs> sacrifice cow. all of my used clothing. <clears throat> I'll sacrifice it. And uh, but what's being implied is um, is the letting go or giving a uh, giving away, and it becomes potent or something when it's something that uh, actually is 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 close to you. And so eventually we are sacrificing. Uh, everything we sacrifice we and this is done symbolically in the the fire sacrifice the ritual um, but in yoga it's becomes gradually more than just symbolic mm -hmm. uh, and so we we are actually sacrificing jnana or wisdom we're sacrificing all of our formulas about how the universe works and we're placing on the what we'd say the altar of pure chit or pure awareness, uh, even the entire text of the of the Mahabharata, you know, we're, that doesn't mean you're getting rid of it. And we learn that sacrifice doesn't mean to reject. It's like taking that and you're just like letting it go for the, and in the Gita, it becomes sattvic um, or productive or brilliant when you, you let it go without the sense of hating it or rejecting it or knowing it's the, you know, the, something that's used. It's like I, I sacrificed my used clothing or something. 
but eventually you're going to sacrifice uh, in the metaphor of the Vedic sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice the entire universe, uh, including your ideas. Um, and and it, sacrifice in that light is becomes, a giving. Yeah, is a giving and it becomes a three-dimensional um, sort of act of truly understanding impermanence and interconnectedness, how they are both impermanence and interconnectedness are both interconnected and impermanent. And that becomes the, the sort of crux of what we learn from a sacrifice that is offered um, as a sort of with gratitude and with generosity towards the rest of the world, towards others. So it starts to become an act of generosity and an act of sincerity and trust and, and perhaps truth. even compassion mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so yoga is is really presented brilliantly as as sacrifice um, and then of course you have to watch all of your definitions and sacrifice your definitions <laughs> of sacrifice uh, which is actually being asked uh, in that's being taught to Arjun and so for example um, there's the, uh, is this which chapter, the um, fourth chapter? Anyway. I don't know. I haven't said it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, one is the sacrifice of sacrifice. And so any concept, the sacrifice of jnana or wisdom or knowledge of all of your conceptual systems, um, this is the sacrifice. So I have a system that allows me to understand, um, you know, which is a bunch of philosophical definitions uh, which are pretty good, um, hopefully, at least they're evolving. And eventually, as in yoga, you have to just take it and you place it on the metaphorical uh, altar of pure awareness. And then in that, you start to see that you, you experience that it is empty of purusha. Mm -hmm. It is just pure prakriti. And the uh, pure prakriti just starts to sparkle if that's uh, the right metaphor and you wow and so the the sacrifice of jnana or wisdom is much better than the sacrifice of your um your integrity uh which that <laughs> some yogis will go there i'll i'll give up my integrity in tantra for the uh uh so i can have more fun um uh but to sacrifice to look that deeply and, um, and so in the, there's the sacrifice, which is one of my favorite ones. Uh, you sacrifice uh, the uh, prana uh, into the apana, and then you turn around and you sacrifice the apana into the prana. Is that what I said? No, no. that's good. Yeah. And so yeah, I always <laughs> that is... mix them because they're, inter they're part of a wave pattern. Um, and so this is considered a very, this is the kind of sacrifice that is being taught as what yoga actually is. And so the word sacrifice means that it's something essential to you. Um, it's just like I'm giving up uh, something that is um, as, and the, this is why it's an interesting concept in relation to the word karma, which merely means to do something. And so this is looking at the a particular level of action, uh, which uh, is this continuous giving. And so in the face of crisis, like mm. Arjuna, or like ourselves, and our daily circumstances, there is this quality that we must um, really cultivate, which is this idea of having an idea about what the whole situation is, and then laying that down sort of as a sacrifice as a an offering to the context within which yeah. we find ourselves yeah. and in that sacrifice pattern <clears throat> especially if it's a good idea okay because yeah. <laughs> most of it we just want to sacrifice you know our, our trash or something i'll <laughs> i will compost that but uh, even your brilliant ideas which you know we, we love to think we have, but uh, 
those have to be sacrificed too. And when you sacrifice them, you get um, the metaphor is you get an upgrade. Um, <laughs> and so particularly, and so you eventually give, you're going to sacrifice your entire life, uh, which doesn't mean suicide, uh, because you're as good as dead anyway, if you look at the, the teachings of Samkhya. But uh, you're going to sacrifice all of these uh, brilliant thoughts you have. You know, you, you start to study something like the Gita or Mahabharata, and you go, oh, my God, that is sacred, too. I had no idea that, uh, you know, um, you know, libraries were sacred. You know? <laughs> and so it doesn't mean you burn the books, but you're going to sacrifice the wisdom. And what that does is it illuminates the... Uh, prakriti or the structural patterns of knowledge and wisdom and then you can let them go and in their release um, there's the uh, insight and so the, the Gita is asking you know that yoga is this profound sacrifice and, and which is essential to to love to yeah. to finding you know what's actually going on and when we we are doing sort of like the fast track for the Gita here, covering as much as we can. But this idea of sacrifice really also starts to be reflected in um, Krishna teaching Arjuna about interconnectedness as he presents himself as being everything in the world. Richard had talked about, you know, seeing the demons and the good guys and bad guys being crushed between the teeth of time. And Krishna reveals himself both metaphorically and, you know, in imagery as being everything. In other words, he is not a God that stands above everything else, but he reveals himself to be this, or to be the simplest things like water, the taste of water. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can see that God or interconnectedness or profound um, connection um, is everything, um, we can then be comfortable with not knowing what will happen, the not knowing thing again, knowing that if we place these things down on the altar of pure awareness, things will change, but we are offering them without attachment to our ideas of what they are, to the ideas mm. of our fruit, the fruits of our actions is what it often is referred mm. to in the Gita. So we offer things with trust and we offer things with, we offer everything with a sense of, you know, even just a glimmer of understanding of the fact that everything's connected. Mm. And it's those things that allow us to really deepen into the core of our own being and feel love. Mm. So the sacrifice is actually, is a gift to other beings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the, the uh, deeper, you know, traditional sacrifice, the Vedic sacrifice, is we're doing this uh, because we're doing it for the environment. We're doing it, uh, for other beings, and as one evolves, uh, as Prakriti does, it's not actually the you that's evolved, it's the Prakriti that you think you are, uh, as it evolves, uh, it's, the sacrifice becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. And so there's the sacrifice then of, the, the sacrifice of knowledge, the sacrifice, and that is, uh, and, and then the placing down of even brilliant insights of, is the sacrifice. And so it becomes more, uh, less and less selfish, uh, less and less miserable um, to the point where it's actually what yoga is, turns out to be. And what, you know, the, the, the love or the bhakti that's talked about is actually this uh, process of deep sacrifice of giving uh, for the benefit of others. Yeah. And so the, uh, because the, you know, and that's, that's the key is that uh, the Gita reveals the 
<clears throat> all of this sacrifice is actually for the benefit of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is even something that the, the traditional gods like Indra have to learn the hard way because they start performing sacrifice so they can get out of the misery of, you know, this lower planet that we live on, you know, and just go to like where it's nice, you know, the suburbs up in heaven. <laughs> but uh, that leaves a complete residue. And so the, the Gita is upgrading that understanding uh, profoundly to you get even the sacrifice of sacrifice, uh, meaning your idea of what the, the sacrificial fire, all of that is, that's all purest Prakriti, uh, which is this deeper connection to all other beings. And so it's, it's really for others that we sacrifice and uh, implying, well, I'm sacrificing my entire existence and my perceptions of the universe of space and time, I'm giving it to others. And so the, the Gita really encourages uh, that service to others uh, as being and it's, it's beautifully presented too when you look at it that way because throughout the text, remember we were saying that Arjuna is always saying, well, what's better, this or this, this or this? And he comes up, he thinks he understands a concept that Krishna has revealed. And then he says, well, what's better, this or this? Um, you know, tell me for certain. And ultimately, as the text progresses, Arjuna begins to really, truly, deeply, profoundly trust his dear friend and his beloved teacher, um, Krishna, and realizes that um, by the very end of the text, instead of saying, well, what's better, this or this, he says, well, how do they compare? How does, um, how does uh, Sanyas compare to Tiag? Tiag? And so in the very end of the book, this idea of sacrificing knowledge has begun to sink into Arjuna rather than having to have a definite answer. Um, he's beginning to see, oh, you can compare and contrast things, which are always the kind of questions on uh, tests that were always so hard in university is compare and contrast this or that rather than you know, multiple choice. And so he's learning this um, as a way of becoming more whole and recognizing that you can only do that if you have developed a relationship of uh, care and trust with the world, but also potentially with the situation you're in, or in the case of the Gita, it's revealed the trust that is developed between Krishna and Arjuna throughout the text. And so at the very end of the text, still, as we've said, 18 chapters later, uh, Krishna has not said, well, here, just do this and your problems are solved. And he says, and he, he's teaching, you know, the profound joy of, uh, you know, waking up and then uh, of then, uh, you know, seeing all beings, you know, seeing all beings truly for what, including yourself as for, you know, the, that divine experience. And then he says, now do what you choose. And he still doesn't tell him what to do, but he does tell him and like, oh, give up all dharmas or formulations uh, and just, you know, come, come to me and he's redefined what he means by me. And so the, the, the text very carefully, uh, Krishna deconstructs all of your theistic or atheistic uh, conceptions, you know, to show that they are these, uh, you know, intellectual patterns of ideas, which are, you know, some of them are brilliant and some of them are really stupid and painful and a lot of them quite uh, inconsequential. But he wants you then, oh, just let go of that because there's something uh, very important. And, uh, and that's to come. And he's redefined. He says, come to me or take shelter or take refuge in me, not uh, surrender. He doesn't use the word surrender. He says, uses the term sharanam, 
which is a Buddhist term that, you know, many people have, throughout history, you know, uh, have, there's so many Buddhist terms in the Gita, it's a, it's a scandal, I think. Um, but Sharanam is take refuge, you meaning, you know, you can, you can come and uh, just, uh, you know, you can bring your family and uh, if you're going to take refuge, bring your sleeping bag or whatever. And rather than surrender to me, meaning, you know, I've beaten you down and now you have no choice. You are my, my uh, uh, eternal slave. That's kind of scary. Uh, and so, so it is this release of all the dharmas, which are uh, the formulations and many of the dharmas being released are, are brilliant. Uh, and then future dharmas, which are going to be upgraded. If you go on the online, if you go online and you can get upgrades, and the upgrades are will go on forever because uh, that's been taught earlier in the Gita that this has been going on for a long time. And in many places, this is just, you know, there's no beginning or end to it. And so you have even are going to let go of the upgrades. Um, which is in the metaphor of technology, that's like, I, how could I possibly do that? And because of something more essential, something sweeter, and Krishna has brilliantly redefined what he means by me. Um, and by that point in the go, you're not sure whether you are, you know, the, the two are quite confused or interwoven in a, in a very delightful sense. And so the, just as the word Atman and Paramatman are no longer, what, what's the difference? Hmm, let's take a look uh, and see if there is a difference at all. Uh, so it's a beautiful giving up, a beautiful sacrifice. Um, and it's, it's the real embodiment of love, of bhakti mm -hmm. and of, of, of surrender, <clears throat> in a sense of, of giving oneself to this, waking up to the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And for the benefit of others, done. yeah. Yeah. And so that's at the very end, you know, there's this whole, and I like to think of it as uh, the, the idea of the bodhisattva or some of the uh, bodhi meaning uh, the awakening principle of the intelligence, which is the buddhi, which that's the charioteer that we named, that this is in all beings, and uh, that the joy of just uh, seeing any being, you know, even the most miserable or the most glorious or the most radiant incarnations or avatars or bodhisattvas, as oh. There's not really a difference. Um, and so there's this natural uh, connection, uh, which is beyond dharma or formulation. And so that's why we keep sacrificing even the excellent formulations, even the whole Gita. Not that this is for book burning. This is where the demons love to, oh, I'll burn the Gita as a sacrifice. <laughs> Um, and so that is a common misunderstanding in certain cults, you know, where you, um, I didn't just put my foot no. in my mouth as a yoga posture. <laughs> but <laughs> but so the, the ultimate teaching then is to really keep the heart open and to keep all beings, including yourself, in the core of your heart. Um, and and to face what arises with that embodied sense of uh, spaciousness and trust and be trustworthy. Mm. And, uh, and then Krishna and Arjuna proceed, the story continues and Arjuna makes his choice, which you will find out may have been good or not, um, depending in the, <laughs> in the Mahabharata. It's a long story. So we have planned to have time for questions and answers, and we've eaten up our entire hour here, just Perfect. getting started. So, <clears throat> but 
I just we're willing. To, yeah. Just to quickly interject. So um, uh, I want to kind of outline what my plan is for what we're going to be doing. And the, the first um, first thing that I would say is just the plan is to roughly cover a chapter a week, uh, which is somewhat ambitious, but to kind of stay on course with the text. The first word of the Bhagavad Gita is Dharma, and the last word is Mama. And you can kind of think of that as Dharma as, in, in this sense, uh, following up on what Richard and Mary were talking about is the text is really asking about what is your dharma? Like, how is it, how is it applicable to you? So as you're reading this, this amazing thing, my suggestion is to not think of it so much as what's going on out there, but to think of it as how does it apply to me and what's the point? And uh, this is kind of a moksha shastra, which is to say it's, it's dealing with how to find uh, joy <laughs> and, and ideally lasting joy. Um, and so that that dhamma and and sorry that dharma and mama means like what is your calling what are those things that you can do to create that synergy that 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 like group a uh, higher effect that uh, you may have experienced um so i also just want to say that there's going to be a difference between sanvad and vivad which is like my idea we had Richard and Mary here today to kind of give like a little background but as we're going through I want it to be this dialectic and a shared experience rather than so not the truth viva like the only truth but we're all going to be sharing our own experiences as we go through the text is my my hope for the for um what we're going to be covering okay that was a lot and then uh the other thing that I wanted to just quickly mention is um I highly recommend their text to go to. I really, really love the translation. Um, you guys did an outstanding job. Um, this is also a very good resource just to kind of contextualize and put things in a framework uh, for what's going on. And then if you're a little bit more of a academic, then you can get the Basha of uh, Shankaracharya, uh, you know, which he doesn't start his commentary until the second chapter, which we're going to start on the 30th uh, but we'll have some backtracking to do just to cover a little bit of what's going on in the first chapter okay now wonderful <laughs> it's an exciting course that you've got laid out yeah and um i i already have like lots of questions um from my own mind um hopefully you guys have some uh, the one thing that I wanted to ask you that's been kind of on my mind is that uh, Krishna, it seems to be omnipotent, that he's omnipotent, like in the 11th chapter when he opens his mouth and does the gnashing of the teeth and all. So why does he build an, uh, an army so big that he can't pick it up? <laughs> why does he build a rock so big that he can't pick it up? Yeah, the omnipotence paradox. And, and the fact is... Uh, that the whole idea of omnipotence is prakriti, uh, because what is it that, you know, you have to define what it is that has this omnipotence or omniscience. There's an omniscience paradox too. Um, yeah, can you, and you're certainly not omnipotent if you uh, can't create something that you can't, that you can then pick up. And so I, I remember, a, one teacher in India that, uh, and this is something he said, oh yes, God can create a rock so big, or a mountain. And he's thinking so big he can't pick it up, but then he'll pick it up anyway. And uh, we go, hmm, you, you just miss the fun of the paradox. Um, <laughs> because say omniscience or omnipotence, that's always from a specific point of view. Yeah. Um, is, is that kind of, Richard, what's, and Mary, what's going on with why they frame it with uh, Dhritarashtra, the blind king, and Sanjaya? So right. those of you who don't know, Sanjaya is kind of like this reporter, you know, like nowadays he'd be like a tweet, you know, he'd like, <laughs> yeah. giving you a live feed of what's going on. And it's like, and now back to Arjuna and Krishna. And, and so there's this like framing of the, of the things that we can't know, like 
you were saying, Richard, about Prakriti and Purusha, you know, that division. Uh, and then we come back to our own world, which is this blind king, right. <laughs> you know, sort of world where we're, yeah. we're not really, you know, is that why they frame it that I mean, it didn't occur to me, but maybe that's uh, the beauty of how it's a great theory. Yeah, it's all it's all within. Yeah, it's all Sanjaya just telling the story to Dhritarashtra, who's blind. And not that we, you know, there maybe we have a blind king. Or maybe we uh, are yeah. blind. So yeah. it's the difference and, between yeah. that and which is heard and that which is uh, told, you know, like there's that jnana and vijnana sort of idea, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, when, as you, and John, this is a wonderful point, like, you know, in writing the book on the Gita, one of the things, you know, when you write a book and we, you know, apologize for even thinking that we were qualified enough to do such a thing because we feel like we've just scratched the surface and we've been working on it for quite a long time. But with this or with the Mahabharata, as you start looking at the texts more and more deeply, you start coming up with these questions exactly like that, that are um, really part of the teachings themselves like why um, certain elements are there and you start thinking about them and they in fact become these profound teachings. Um, so the, the, the bottom line with a lot of these is that they provide sort of limitless um, information. If we don't do the thing to, that humans, myself, you know, all of us, myself to a big degree tend to do, which is to draw a conclusion and then say, okay, I got that one figured out. I'm checking it off my list. Mm -hmm. Rather than that, to draw a conclusion, which you must, and then set it down and then look again and, and look from a different angle or get a different point of view or get some feedback. And so that's the way, that's the beauty of these. Yeah, Sanjaya's teachings at the end, yeah. uh, that he's explaining to the blind king, Drisharashtra, uh, those are pr very profound. Sanjaya really is, he's saying again and again, I return again, and, and, and he keeps repeating himself uh, about, I listen to this dialogue, and he's listening actually to uh, well, one in the, the story itself, but he's also listening to this ongoing dialogue, which is happening currently uh, in the form of your mind <laughs> and all of the different voices. That's the, dia the dialectic, this inquiry is going on. Um, and he re is returning again and again, and his hair is standing on end. He's so excited. Um, and I, I really love Sanjaya's little commentary at the end. That's uh, and so. Oh, that's our homework is to read that. All right. Well, thank you <laughs> so much. Uh, I'm afraid we have to cut it short there, but um, uh, so lovely to have you guys. And maybe uh, we can plan to try to shoot for having you guys back on according to your schedule as we get closer to the end. If yeah, if that, we'd love it. That'd be great. Awesome. Yeah be awesome wonderful yeah so thank you guys everybody for showing up and uh feel free to send me questions for the next ones that you have and follow along on the 30th um next week as a as a moon day for us on the friday so uh, we'll, we'll start on the 30th of july um, wonderful thank you everyone thank you so much for doing this john yeah, thanks john good yeah. to see you all bye, -bye. <laughs> bye.